We all go a little mad sometimes. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Halloween edition of Art 101 with Mr. Burger. Legend my ass. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, in this edition of Art 101 with Mr. Burger, old Magnus is going to talk to you a little bit about a great romantic artist, J.M.W. Turner. Well... The beginning of Joseph Mallard William Turner's art career is like a lot of artists of this romantic time. However, he would eventually become England's greatest landscape painter and really shape the art coming out of England during that time. His father was a barber and he had no interest in art whatsoever. And his mother was mentally unstable being placed in an asylum in 1799 and would pass away there some five years after being admitted. He had one sibling, a sister, who died at the age of five in 1786. In that year, as a young boy, he was sent to live with his uncle, a West London butcher. Unknowingly, this would definitely benefit J.M.W. Turner going forward and he would acquire his first sketchbook at this time as well. It was a small 6x10 book that he filled with sketches of buildings and landscapes, work that was definitely inspired by his first drawing instructor, Thomas Moulton, a landscape painter who had a flair for architectural design. Here's Johnny! As a young man, he would get involved with a lady by the name of Sarah Danby, a singer and actress whose husband had just died, but they became somewhat involved. Over their 20-year relationship, they would have two daughters. However, they never got married. He had no sort of desire for a relationship, and he was too focused for Sarah, and he was not interested in a relationship with his two daughters. He was just too focused on developing his art career. Over the course of his career, he would create over 20,000 paintings and drawings, but that path to 20,000 had to start somewhere. He had a good foundation for Malton, but he had to keep going forward, and eventually he had crossed paths with a respected academic artist who was known for his disaster scene paintings. Philippe de Lautherborg would work to develop young Turner. He had hired the 16-year-old Turner to help with painting sets at the Opera House. He had some formal training at the Royal Academy School and started classes there in 1798, which is probably where he met Sarah. Anyway. Hey, you're gonna like it down here. Artistically, he would be influenced by watercolor paintings done by an artist by the name of John Robert Cousins. Now, as it would turn out, Cousins was the patient of Dr. Thomas Monroe at the Mental Institution. Turner, as well as his fellow artist Thomas Girton, who worked to copy paintings in exchange for oyster suppers and meetings with Cousins. Most of the money that Turner had earned was generated by selling watercolor paintings and engravings. However, he was criticized for the lack of finish in these works. His work at this time was widely seen after two of his engravings were published in 1794. The following year he would begin to work in oil and began to be influenced by the paintings of Nicolas Poussin, a French Baroque painter. 
this would inspire him to use his color a little bit more freely. And as his work began to loosen up and become a little more painterly, we can see that playing into some of the content that he was creating as well. Turner would become exceptionally good at painting bad weather. In an attempt to study weather, he had himself strapped to the mast of a boat in order to study a storm, which almost resulted in his drowning. You're gonna be just fine. I'm your number one fan. His style was very much an indication of what was to come with the Impressionist painters. In fact, Turner, like the Impressionists that followed, had a need to imitate nature through their art. There are three main romantic ideas on nature that Turner would follow. First, he would use a very sublime subject matter, intended to shock the viewer. Secondly, the nature was very fluid, meaning that the nature was always changing. And third, nature really was alive in his work. Nature was God, and nature was sympathetic to the humans and always watching, but unable to alter their fate. Don't give it in hell if it knows too much already. Through his training at the academy and the skills that he had developed, he was able to earn many opportunities. One of those was his ability to travel abroad and study at the Louvre in Paris, France before moving on to Switzerland. Later on, in about 1820, he would study in Rome when he was about 45 years old. He was able to travel quite a lot over the years. He was eventually appointed as a professor of perspective at the academy in 1807. Some four years prior to that, he was starting the process of building his own art gallery. He had been saving up his money for a while and was beginning to get a reputation as somewhat of a tightwad with his money. Once things were up and running, his father would close down his shop to work in his son's gallery as the business manager. As a matter of fact, Turner was insistent on his dad making the 11 mile trip every morning to open the gallery's doors. But being a generally antisocial person, JMW was likely wanting his dad to work with the customers and sales so he wouldn't have to. Now, when comfortable, it is said that he could be a very happy guy, but with new people he was very serious and was constantly on guard. He was so focused on his artistic goals that he neglected human contacts. It was his goal to make landscape paintings on an artistic level that was greater than the popular history paintings of his time. The bulk of his work was nautical in theme, and he was oftentimes asked about the incorrect adornments on the ships that he was painting. And to that, Turner would say, My job is to draw what I see, not what I know. Now this is great advice to other generations of artists. Now, Mr. Berger has told me one of the greatest works that he ever created was one called The Slave Ship. It was a controversial painting from what I understand because its extremely political stance against slavery. Turner was disgusted at the thought of slavery and fought very vigorously against it. He hated slavery and he hated this painting. What a nice boat. That was its intent, for people to hate it. We are first shocked by the people in the water. Live cargo was insured. People in the business of selling slaves could not collect a cent for a dead slave on land. However, if they were lost at sea, they could be compensated for their loss. It reminds me of a movie I once saw called Amistad. Anyway, this calm water in the painting is getting very rough from a violent storm in the distance. This is showing God's anger with human choices. These people are dead in the water, and God is sad and enraged. Britain would abolish slavery in 1833 in most of the empire. When this painting was first exhibited in 1840, it was hung beside a poem that he had written. There is just some things you gotta do. Don't mean you have to like it. Another of Turner's great works was rain, steam, and speed. After taking a trip by train across the country in 1844, he was inspired to create this work. 
traveling at the unbelievable speed of 90 miles an hour. Turner reportedly stuck his head out the window during the rainstorm for about 10 minutes to observe the force and the effects of speed, rain, and wind upon his senses. The train itself would become a symbol of progress, a progress that he and many others would welcome with open arms. But Turner was just like everybody else. He got older, he got ill, and became depressed and would practically withdraw himself from all human contact. Not that he really liked a lot of human contact in the first place, but up to an even more extreme degree, I suppose. He never really had any friends, probably because he had a bit of a violent streak and, again, didn't really like people that much. His home and his gallery both became dilapidated structures of disrepair. His greatness would dissolve in alcoholism, living off a mixture of rum and milk. You're too old to stop me! You're all too old! The only person who would see him, or probably wanted to, was his housekeeper, Mrs. Booth. She had sold him a new house and lived there with him, although she had no idea that he was a famous and wealthy artist in the taverns around his home that he would frequent. He was only known as Admiral Booth. Moments before his death, he would say, it is through these eyes, closed forever at the bottom of the tomb, that generations yet unborn will see nature. And just before nine o'clock in the morning, on a nice December day, he would die, and would become buried in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Some years after his death, the Impressionists like Camilla Pizarro, Claude Monet, and Pierre-Auguste Renoir, probably others, would credit him with developing the roots of their fundamental beliefs. In the manifesto they would write, a group of French painters, united in the same aesthetic aims, applying themselves with passion to the rendering of form in the movement, as well as the figurative phenomena of light, cannot forget that they have been preceded in this path by the great master of the English, the illustrious Turner. I tell you, I really enjoyed this opportunity to talk to you all about J.M.W. Turner. If you like my presentation, please interact with the video of me, Love to Me and Mr. Burger. Happy Halloween. We'll see you next time. <laughs>